You have an op-ed out with the former Secretary of the State, uh, George Shultz, today in the Washington Post, in which you're proposing a very different approach to basically getting our arms around climate control in what you call a carbon dividends approach, which sounds a lot like a carbon, carbon tax to me, but why do you think that this is doable in the United States today? Look, I think it's in everybody's interest because the idea is that by using prices rather than heavy-handed regulation, we address climate change in a way that's better for business. Look, how can a proposal that taxes fossil fuels and is endorsed by Exxon and British Petroleum possibly really be doing great damage to uh, the energy economy. The truth is it'll help the energy economy by moving away from uh, the kind of command and control regulation that we've relied on for uh, too long. At the same time, this builds in a constituency because every American is going to share an equal proportion in the revenue and is going to receive a kind of dividend much like the citizens in Alaska receive a dividend as a result of Alaska's uh, oil wealth. So this is by creating the dividend, it is providing an entitlement for all Americans that they will value, and it's removing the regulation that's been most worrisome for business. So it seems to me this is very much a win-win approach, and crucially, Unlike the current approach, it stands up for U.S. interests through a border adjustment that makes sure that U.S. producers won't be at any kind of competitive disadvantage because of the step we're taking. And so for those of, in our audience who might not have read the op-ed piece, but I'm sure they're going to now, as I understand the basic f theory is you'd have a, a certain tax per ton of coal, $40 I think you talk about, and that money then would be distributed to the populace overall. How would it be distributed? Is this progressive or regressive? It's progressive because it's the same amount for people with every income. So if your income is $40,000, it's going to be the rebate is going to be a higher fraction than if your income is $80,000 and higher and higher by even more than if your income is $200,000 or $2 million. So this is about the most progressive approach you can take uh, to climate policy while at the same time being very good for business because of the regulations that will be removed and being very good for competitiveness because of the adju uh, border adjustment. But, but Larry, as an economist, are you worried at all about this border adjustment notion? Uh, you, you say that this will help us competitively around the world. As I understand it, there has never in history been a border adjustment tax imposed anywhere. We don't know how it would work. It would be very fiendishly difficult. Wouldn't it complicate it? Are you worried about that, that we really we're going someplace we've never been before? I don't think so. Most. Uh, David, I, David, look, uh, it's the essence of progress to go where you've never uh, been before. I, I've talked to any number of experts. Uh, the basic idea of putting taxes on things that come through an international border, that, you know, goes back to well before our Constitution. Uh, in a sense, uh, taxes at the border are the oldest and most traditional kind of tax. And it turns out that most of the energy embodied in what the United States imports is embodied in a relatively limited number of products. So in today's uh, world with what information technology makes possible, I think it's a make weight by people who don't want this for other reasons to suggest that this is somehow infeasible. So, so, Larry, let's come back to more broad topics of international cooperation that you started off on beyond something like this uh, approach to, to carbon. Uh, what are the effects, the negative effects, on the U.S. economy and on growth if we don't find a way to cooperate internationally better than perhaps we have been the last two or three months? Now, look, ultimately it's about uh, war and peace. Uh, the United States didn't find a way to cooperate after the First World War, we withdrew from the League of Nations. We insisted on punitive uh, debt repayments from others. Uh, after a few, after some years, we enacted the Smoot-Hawley tariff, and ultimately, it was 20 of the darkest years uh, humanity has known. The United States rep 
stood for the idea of global community. That's what the Marshall Plan uh, was about. That's what the Bretton Woods institutions were about after the Second World War. And with all the problems, we uh, have seen 70 years of uh, more peace and more prosperity than humanity has ever known uh, before. And so the stakes in these different approaches over time are very large. Yes, one can make calculations from some economic model that GNP growth will be a few tenths of a percent higher with uh, the right trade agreements than uh, with the wrong trade agreements. But ultimately, uh, this is about whether we live in a uh, world that progresses together or a world that regresses and struggles apart. So, so Larry, I'm glad you wrote, raised Smoot Holly because uh, we had Mark Carney, the head of the Bank of England, give a speech earlier today in which he specifically referred to Smoot Holly and what happened there with protectionism. And one of the points he made was that countries like the United States and the UK, which have gone more over to a services uh, economy, are disadvantaged compared, for example, with a Germany and a Japan because a lot of the trade reform, the reduction of tariffs, have happened in the goods area, not the services one. And unless we get the services to catch up in terms of the loosening of tariff barriers, then we will always be at a disadvantage. Is he right? I, I have not yet read Mark's uh, speech, but I think it's a valuable point. And certainly some of the crucial steps in uh, TPP were things like the protection of uh, intellectual uh, property, were various aspects of access uh, for uh, service producers. And yes, those are going to be very important uh, things in uh, trade agreements uh, going forward. Look, what Mark Carney captured in that speech is a much broader truth, which is that the United States didn't have important protection against other countries' manufactured goods 35 years ago, before NAFTA, before the Uruguay Round, before any of the trade agreements. And so the idea that somehow we're doing something dangerous by entering into trade agreements that's going to threaten American workers is really nonsense. The truth is that our trade agreements are very disproportionate with other countries reducing their trade barriers much more than the United States reduces its trade barriers. But does this hold uh, the opportunity, at least, for real progress, for example, with China? Because right now, the Trump administration is negotiating a series of agreements, they say, with China. They've already had the first. And they really want to focus on services, particularly financial services. Is there an opportunity there for the United States in our bilateral relations with China on financial services? I'm sure that it will be valuable to continue the discussions of opening. Frankly, I think the prism through which we view trade agreements should be U.S. jobs and U.S. incomes. And my sense is that much of what people talk about when they talk about financial services trade is basically businesses that may be headquartered in the United States doing more business in China with Chinese nationals as their employees. And so I'm not sure how much that really contributes to uh, the U.S. economy. So I'm all for our succeeding, but as I look for negotiating priorities, I would look for issues that are going to go to the bottom line for the American middle class. And I'd be a little skeptical that financial services would be at the top of that list.